Hi, my name is Dan Hare, and I'm one of the persons that have been asked to lead one of the growth groups. And uh, we're doing this for the first time by videotape. And that, for me, means that uh, a lot of different things, and uh, I want to be able to share them with you. But first of all, I want to tell you this. Welcome. We are so glad you've come to join us. And we hope that you'll be able to use this in, in, in a study by yourself. Take your time to do it. And uh, maybe not be as rushed as we might be on a Sunday morning. I'm really glad you're with us. Because it might be that some of you have joined us for the very first time. Some of you have been a regular part of our growth group. But this opportunity, putting it on the video, putting it on the church website, uh, allows us to let everybody have access to it. There are several things that I, I, I want you to know. Uh, while we're now that they're different, that are different now that we're uh, doing it uh, by videotape. One is that. Um, um, the class is probably going to be a lot short. In fact, I know it is. But one of the things that we valued so much as we were going through our study uh, on the Ten Commandments is that uh, it allowed us to have some interaction. We could read the verses together. We could read the verses from different versions. And one of the things that I appreciated so much was the eye contact that I had with, with the people that were in the class. Because as I was talking or teaching, uh, I'd be able to look out at them and see if they were puzzled. Uh, ask them if they understood. Ask them if they knew the background to what I was saying. Uh, ask them if, if what I said made any sense at all. And then we'd be able to, to back up and to uh, put things together so that, that it worked for all of us. We're not going to be able to do that but uh, uh, on the videotape. But uh, one of the things, there are several things I do want to tell you. Please, as we're working on the videotape, always have your Bible with you as you study. And I, I, I want you to know it doesn't make any difference uh, what version you're using. We often use different versions in our class, and sometimes that's the richness of it. Because as we read it from different versions, as, as we talk about the scripture in different ways, we can see different things in it, and it enlightens our understanding. I also want you to know that we have, ha we have used a couple of handouts. One is called the Exodus from Egypt. And I have it here uh, in print form. Cassie informs me that if you come by the office and if you don't have one, she'll be able to give you one or she'll be able to email it to you. I'll be using this handout uh, today. I do not have it on the screen behind me, but I'll be able to describe it enough, I think, so that you'll be able to use the handout or use one of the maps that are available to you in your Bible or uh, in a dictionary or, or some form that helps you to study the Bible. The other thing that I want you to know is that even though I can't see you and watch your face, and because we're not able to dialogue in person, if you have a question, if you don't understand what I'm saying, if it doesn't make sense to you, please feel free to email, email me and I'll, I'll try to answer it in the following week for your class, for the class. Uh, my email is marchhare47 at gmail.com M-A-R-C-H-A-I-R 47 at gmail.com Now, I want to introduce what we've been studying. We've been talking about getting to know our covenant God. Now those of you who have been in other covenant groups or in other uh, growth groups, 
uh, might recognize that our pastor, David Werner, suggested that we take a look at the Ten Commandments. But I'm kind of a kind of a rebel in that way. When I looked at that uh, invitation, I recognized that uh, people not might not want to come just because we're saying study the Ten Commandments. So I tried to give it a more invitational uh, name, but that's what we're going to be doing. We want to get to know our covenant God. And so as we study the Ten Commandments, I want you to understand a couple of things. First of all, we are most familiar with the commandments that are listed for us in Exodus 20, verses 1 to 17. Most of us, if we have looked them up in our Bible, or if we need to look them up and never have looked them up, that's, most, that's the most familiar place that you will turn to in the Old Testament to find them. But what I want you to know is that it's not the only place in the uh, Bible, in the Old Testament particularly, where they're given. They were given by Moses to the people of Israel again in Deuteronomy 5, 7 to 21. Deuteronomy is an interesting book because it takes place in a wholly different time period than Exodus. Exodus is chronicling the time when they came out of Egypt. Deuteronomy uh, is a compilation of Moses' speeches at the end of his life, just as they were ready, about ready to go into the Promised Land. The commandments um, in Israel, uh, excuse me, the commandments uh, that were given in, in Exodus uh, were given about three months after uh, they had left the Promised Land. And again, uh, pointing to this map, um, they came out of Egypt, which is right here, and they traveled down through what we call the Sinai Peninsula and down to the place that's called Mount Sinai. This whole area is called the Sinai Peninsula, but this is where the mountain is that uh, uh, the people gathered and the plain around it to hear the Ten Commandments. The commandments in Deuteronomy were not given then. They were given 40 years afterwards the Bible teaches us that the Israelites had wandered for 40 years because they disobeyed God. They disobeyed God because they didn't follow the, the uh, invitation of the spies to go in, ten, uh, two of the spies to go in and take the land. Ten of the spies were very uh, fearful of going into the Promised Land because they had seen giants and they were, and they'd seen walled cities, and they were afraid. They knew it was a promising land. They could see the, the figs and the pomegranates and all of the fruit of it, but they were afraid of the people. Deuteronomy is a compilation of a series of uh, speeches that Moses gave to the Israelites just before he died. Deuteronomy is, is Greek for second law and uh, it was right before uh, God took Moses' life. You need to remember that there were only two people that left uh, Egypt that entered into the promised land. We learned that one of the last times we were together in person and we wrestled with that a little bit because we learned that Moses wasn't even one of them. Moses never got to see the promised land. Only two of them did. The two that did get to see the promised land that had left Egypt and got into the promised land 40 plus years later were Joshua and Caleb. 
that's uh, told to us in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 35 to 38. We'll not take time to read some of these scriptures. We will take time to read some, but not all of them. This one, why don't you read on your own? Because it, tell, it shows us and tells us that these were the two that obeyed God fully and they were rewarded by getting into the promised land. Moses, however, as I said before, wasn't able to go into the promised land because of his disobedience. He had disobeyed God, and God said, that's it. You'll never see in person and walk on the promised land yourself. Here's a scripture that, uh, that we won't read, but I would encourage you to read it. It's Numbers 20, 1 to 12. And when you read that, you'll discover what the disobedience was that Moses committed, that God said, okay, Moses, because you disobeyed me, you won't go into the land. And you have to read it carefully. Because if you don't read it carefully, you'll miss exactly what Moses did and what Moses didn't. The Bible, however, tells us that he was able to, to see the promised land. He was able to look into the promised land. And right before God took him, he was allowed to, to climb a mountain called Nebo and see it. He was able to climb up into, into the mountain and look over the vastness of the land that God had given to the Israelites. One of the fun things for me is that we celebrate Moses' death with a very well-known hymn, a very well-known hymn. And if we were in class together, uh, I would ask you all if you knew what it was. I, I, I don't know if you would, but the well, very well-known hymn that describes that is Sweet Hour of Prayer. Now, you aren't, going to listen, you aren't going to find it by reading or singing the first verse, or even the second verse, or even the third verse. But go back and take a look at it, either in a hymnal or uh, on your computer, and read it. And you still may miss it altogether, because it's in the fourth verse. Here it is. The fourth verse says, the fourth verse written, all, uh, the Sweet Hour of Prayer is written by William Walford. And uh, in, in the fourth verse it says, Sweet Hour of Prayer, Sweet Hour of Prayer, may I thy consolation share. Till Mount, from Mount Pisgah's lofty height, I view my home and I take my flight. This robe of flesh I'll drop and dry to seize the everlasting prize. Now you might say to me, well, Dan, that doesn't say anything about Nebo. Doesn't that, Mount Nebo is not mentioned anywhere, but Mount Pisgah is. One of the things that we believe is that, that Nebo was a mountain range. And uh, in that mountain range was a tall mountain called Pisgah. And we believe that Moses climbed Mount Pisgah and from that mountain, from that high mountain top in the mountain range, he was able to look into the promised land. Now, you need to see too that he was able to view his home and then take his flight, which means that God would take his take his life. And so William Walford said, this robe of flesh, which means this body, I'll drop and then I'll rise to seize the everlasting prize. Now, using Exodus 20, uh, 1 to 17, 
there are two sections of the commandments. And it might be interesting for you or important for you to divide the two. The first section are the first four commandments. And verses 3 to 11 connect us with our relationship to God. The first four commandments talk about how we think about and how we obey our God. The last six, verses 12 to 17, connect us with our ethics and our moral duties to people. What's that saying to us is, it's important for us to worship and, and to try to praise God, but it's also important for us to get along with other people. And we do it by obeying those last six commandments. The first four relate to our love to God. The last six relate to our love to our neighbor. Now this is one of the scripture verses that we are going to look up. Take your Bibles and take a look at Matthew. We're going to turn to the New Testament to Matthew chapter 22. Toward the end of the chapter, he was, Jesus was asked about a scholar, by a scholar of the law, what, what are the most important commandments there in the whole law? And Jesus said to them a very important thing. He said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first. This is the most and most important commandment. The second is like unto it. it is, and it is, love others as much as you love yourself. All of the law of Moses and the books of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Basically, what Jesus was saying was, if you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, those are the first four commandments. But the second portion is what we've just described. The last six of the Ten Commandments is to love others as much as you love and if you could get those two concepts in your head, you would be, you, you would be able to uh, know all of the commandments that uh, Moses gave to us uh, and that we were to follow. I want to talk to you first about the uh, first commandment. We've set some background to all of this, but now let's really dig into the commandments themselves. If you take a look at verse 3, it says to us, Do not worship any god except me. If you're using another version, it might say to you, um, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. If you're using even more modern versions, it might uh, say it just a bit differently. But that's the first commandment. It's in verse 3. I need to tell you that um, Jehovah God had to say this to the Israelites. Because the Israelites were coming out of Egypt. See, after they had come out of Egypt, they were so familiar with those gods that they didn't know what else to do. Remember, there were like only 70 people that went into the Promised Land, that left the Promised Land and went into Egypt. Uh, there were four, almost two and a half to three million people who came out. God wanted them to know that he was distinct, he was different, and more special than absolutely anything, or for that matter, anyone 
that they had seen. Now, let's talk about that second commandment. That's in verses 4 to 6. It says to us, Do not make any idols that look like anything in the sky or the earth or in the ocean under the earth. Don't bow down and worship idols. I am the Lord your God, and I demand all your love. If you reject me, I will punish your families for three or four generations. But if you love me and obey my laws, I will be kind to your families for thousands of generations. Now, what you need to understand is that it sounds like that second commandment is a an expansion of the first. But here's the question that is interesting to me. The question I'd like to ask you, processor, does it sound like by reading that those verses that God was treating them like dummies? And they just had to say it all over again? I mean he said it once. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And now he was saying, thou shalt have no other, no. <coughs> excuse me, you shall not have any graven images in front of me. <coughs> but, please remember who they were. Please remember what they had seen in Egypt and, and ever since they left Egypt. What I'm trying to say to you is that those two and a half, maybe three million people that came out of Egypt, all they had ever known was idolatry. You have to remember, that's all they'd ever known is what the Egyptian gods had been. They watched the Egyptian gods. And, by the way, who were they in Egypt? They were slaves. Let me ask you a question. How much education does a slave have? Probably none. Could they read? Could they write? Probably not. They only knew the gods that they saw, that they heard. And he had to and he had to remind them who and what they had seen since they'd been in Egypt. But it's important to know that it's also it's also important to know that they had seen the, those other images uh, among the people uh, that lived in the Sinai Peninsula as they were traveling through. Now, God's demand in verse 5 is the reason that they cannot bow down and worship other gods. By the way, I'm reading from the contemporary English version, and so it's probably different than the one you're using, but that's what, that's what makes part of the richness of this. Again, take a look at verse 5. Don't bow down and worship idols. I am the Lord your God. Here it is. And I demand all your love. I demand all your love. Now, if you take a look at the Deuteronomy commentary, you're going to find how different that was. The list in Deuteronomy uh, touches all, all of Egypt's idolatry, and it's quite a list. They worshipped oxen, heifer, sheep, goats, lions, dogs, monkeys. They worshipped cats and hawks and cranes and crocodiles. They worship, worship serpents and frogs and, lie, and flies, beetles, the Nile River. They worship the fish and the sun, the moon. They worship darkness. They worship the night. And that was so hard for them 
because that's all they'd known. But it was so hard for them as well because they had been taught that Jehovah God is invisible. You can't see him. You simply can't. That's why it was so easy for them to use images and animals, anything, something that they could see just so you could see it and worship. You see, if you can visualize God, maybe you can worship him better. How, how is it for you in church? If, if you have your word, eyes and, and thoughts on God, what do you see? <laughs> Sometimes you have to close your eyes because you're going to see people. You're going to see the pastor or someone else up in front. You're going to see uh, things that are uh, on the chancel. But if you're going to worship God, you have to cut all of those things out and just see him. See, it's so much easier if you can visualize or or see an image of him if you can do that it's easier to worship him <clears throat> what you need to understand and what is so important at this point is that you God was trying to teach them that you need to worship the creature and you, you you need, excuse me, I said that incorrectly. You can't worship the creature. You cannot worship the creature. You have to worship, worship the creator. What does that mean? Well, I think it means that the creature is everything that God created. Oh, yeah, the ox and the fish, the, the Nile, and all that kind of stuff were might have been creatures for contained creatures for them but they were things that he made that he made and God said no nah, that's not good enough don't worship the creature worship me the creator who made them and at this point I, I want you to see a visual and I want you to see a critical difference. And this is really important. It was always wrong, always, to make a, an image from human hands and worship it as God. Always. But in many places in the Bible, uh, the, the writers use a visual image to describe God. No, that's not wrong. Let me give you some examples. David, in Psalm 23, described God as a shepherd. Exodus chapter 15 describes him as a God as a soldier. Isaiah chapter 66 talks about God being like a mother. Isaiah 31 says that he is a lion. Now, these pictures are metaphorical. These pictures help us to understand God. They're, they're just pictures in our mind, something that we have seen, but they're not God. They're the creature, not the creator. But you need to understand when 
The Bible talks about a shepherd, a soldier, a mother, a lion. They're not definitions. Is God only a lion? Absolutely not. Is God only a shepherd? Absolutely not. But his characteristics are like those things, like those persons. And I think that helps us to get God in our mind. If he's invisible and we can't see him, sometimes all we can do is relate to him things that we can see. Not the creature, but the creator. Now, there's a punishment in this verse, in these verses, and there's a promise. The punishment says, if you, and again using the contemporary English version, uh, he says, uh, if you reject me, I will punish your families for three or four generations. That's the punishment. But then the wonderful thing is that there's a promise that contrasts it. But if, and in my Bible it says, but if you love me and obey my laws, I will be kind to your families for thousands of generations. The punishment and the promise. I want for a couple of minutes to apply the commandments to our lives. It's important we do. Never is it just okay to read the Bible for facts. Never is it, important, never is it okay to read the Bible for knowledge. But if we can't apply what we read in our lives, um, we're missing something. So let's try to apply these two commandments, shall we? Let me ask you this question. Is it easy for us to keep the first commandment? Uh, again, in the version that I learned when I was little, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Is that hard for you to keep? And if it is, what makes it hard for you to keep? Probably, most of us, would probably say no. That's not hard for us to keep because we know that God is God. Second question. Is it any easier for us to keep the second commandment about the graven images? The things that, we, that were made by hand. <laughs> Here's where it gets tougher. Do you have any graven images around your home? Huh? Any graven images? Well, you probably say no. I haven't made an, a graven image lately. I haven't made something out of clay or or stone and just set up and set it up and say, "That's my God." But dig deeper, folks. If the graven images aren't in your home, are they in your life? The next time we get together, we're going to begin talking about the third commandment in verse 7. I'm so glad that you were able to be with us this morning. Again, Next time we do a video, uh, uh, some videotaping, we're going to be taking, continuing, continuing this look at the Ten Commandments so we're getting to know our covenant God. By the way, uh, the word covenant is so important. It, it, it means an agreement, an agreement between God and me. And that's really what I want to do during these days that we have together.
talk about the agreement that we should have between our God and our lives, in our lives, and in our families too. I'd like to pray with you before we go. Gracious God, you've been so good to us. You're so loving. You're so kind. You're so good. As we take a look at these particular um, commandments and the study of our covenant God, we just ask that you would help us in special ways to see you more clearly and love you more dearly. Watch over all the persons, please, who are suffering, who are separated, who just need love. May what we are doing on our church website, those devotionals that Pastor David and others are doing, what we're doing, the videotaping of our growth groups, may they help us to be connected, connected with each other. Because it's so much easier in this walk that we call life to do it if we Bless us in Jesus' precious name.